Hello, everyone. We're very happy to be here, excited to chat with you all. Um, we will introduce ourselves and share some logistics in a moment, but I know you all are coming straight from another session. Um, and hopefully, uh, if, if you needed to go to the restroom, you took you took the agency and did so. So while you're here um, and waiting for our friends to join, uh, since the topic of this session is the science of reading in personalized learning, we'd love if you could type in the chat, uh, what are some of your expectations in a personalized learning program? Either one you use or as you're looking at them, what are you looking for? We've got we, folks from all over joining. I was here. going to say the exact same thing with folks. So exciting. Hey, North Carolina, that's where I am too. It's Jennifer, differentiation, data, diagnostics, adaptive. This is awesome. Choice, individualization, targeted instruction, self pacing. It sounds like you all have had some experience with personalized learning. Um, awesome, well keep going and, and adding them to the chat. Before we get started, I just want to thank you again for joining this presentation, um, The Science of Reading and Personalized Learning. I'm Laura Seal. And I am Ann Lucas. We practice that. Um, and for closed <laughs> captioning, please look into the QA box below for the link. The link will open in a separate window in your computer. Note, you can select translations in that window as well for Spanish, French, Haitian, Creole, traditional Chinese, Portuguese, Hindi, Russian, and Arabic. Uh, like all the other sessions today, this one will be recorded and available for replay as soon as the session ends. I'm sure you will be very quick to hit that replay button. And we will be monitoring Q&A uh, in the chat throughout the presentation, but we also uh, designated a little bit of time for it at the end. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all for your participation. We have a couple more things that we'll ask you to lend your insights to. Um, so, so you all uh, uh, tackle different aspects of this definition that we really like from the Student Achievement Partners. Uh, this reads, personalized learning and literacy education is an approach in which teaching and other learning experiences build on each student's uh, strengths, address each student's needs, spur student motivation and agency and helps all students meet grade level standards and ultimately achieve college and career readiness. So I think this touched on a lot of the things that you all called out in the chat. And so as I mentioned, we we're going to talk about the science of reading in personalized learning uh, today and what you should be looking out for as you are evaluating new programs or maybe reevaluating the ones that you already have. We are going to speak from our own experience as we were, were trying to decide whether or not we as a company wanted to build one, um, what we and our research partners really learned about what is needed in, in, a, um, in a personalized learning program and what was already out there. So we'll be sharing some insights from our own experiences. We will first talk a little bit about why we really need to make sure that science of reading is in personalized learning. And then we're gonna go into the four key features that we should be looking for and analyzing in personalized learning and, and different approaches to each of them. We'll do two first, and then we will take a three minute break um, and then we'll cover the remaining two. And I heard that you have a really interesting anecdote about, about attention spans, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> it is. I recently learned um, that the average, well, actually, maybe we could put in the chat what everyone thinks the average adult attention span is during an online presentation. You can just type it in, whatever you think it is. One minute, one second. <laughs> Well, I guess it's four minutes, 28 seconds, because that's <laughs> <laughs> the average adult attention span before we start to get distracted in here. Ooh, someone guessed it um, is 10 minutes. So we uh, we are going to try to hope we're hopefully try to make uh, make use of that attention span by giving a little break here. Um, I know this is a long day with a lot of virtual sessions, so um, we hope that that will help uh, help all of you. Thanks, Anne. I love the, the range of expectations 
<laughs> for our <laughs> adult learners. Um, but Anne, actually, I'll, I'll keep it uh, over to you for our intro. Yeah, so uh, we want to kick off today's session with an introduction to a very special creature, one that is near and dear uh, to all of our hearts here at Amplify, the Curioso. Um, in our personalized learning program, Amplify Reading, uh, your Curioso is your learning companion. It is a curious, helpful, uh, and at times a little mischievous friend who appears throughout the program and grows and learns alongside each student as they move through the program uh, in their own personalized path. Uh, so the more students grow and learn themselves, the more their curiosos start to earn customizations and new reading powers. So the curioso not only becomes your learning companion, but actually a reflection of your growth in the, in the program as well. Um, and at Amplify, we believe that everyone has their own inner curioso. So we wanted to start by learning more about each of you and the curioso that we know lives inside of you. Uh, so in just a second, someone is going to drop a link in the chat to our curioso personality quiz. So take a few minutes to just answer the questions. We promise it's uh, only just a couple of minutes long and find out which curioso you are. And once you've finished, we would love for you to share your results in the chat. I think I just saw the link drop live there. It's apps.learning.amplify.com there. So go ahead and click on that. I'm very excited, Anne. I know, I am too. <laughs> I know everyone has a favorite, favorite Curioso deep down, one that really resonates with them. Sure, we'll see some results rolling in soon. I know I personally took this personality quiz a couple of times and I got the same Curioso every time. So I was like, it's true. This is really who my Curioso is. So you had a different background color? <laughs> I was really, you know, trying hard. It's the walrus dude, love it. <laughs> um, and so you should be seeing something like this where you have your Curioso with different customizations um, and then some um, attributes. Uh, so you can share it, there's a share button at the bottom which will give you a link and then you can drop it in the chat. Um, some sort of- Yeah, I see some and people just sharing descriptions too, the it. orange one, the blue one. The Shakespearean rough. <laughs> ah, the dragon with the acorn hat. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh, I love Very it. Very literary, I love that. A dragon with a sparkling tail. Oh my goodness. So I'd love to hear how, uh, as these results are coming through and you're meeting and reading about Cur your Curioso, does this feel accurate to you? Were you surprised? Did you feel like the the party hat really <laughs> embodied who you were as a person? Um, I know for me and Laura, when we when we were initially taking this quiz, we felt like it was very accurate. Um, sounds like Cheryl, Denise, Kaylin, <laughs> lots of folks are agreeing that it feels really accurate. Um, and, and we felt the same way. It felt really personal to us. Um, and so while we did wanna kick this off with a silly and fun exercise, we also wanted to use this as an example of the power of personalization. And we'll speak a lot today about personalized learning from a pedagogical perspective, but there's also power in personalization from a fun perspective. Um, I know I said that Laura and I really felt like this Curioso spoke to us. Um, and, and for kids, I think having something that feels really personal, something that they have agency like this to really customize and change and something that they feel like is representing them and them only, it's unique. It can make such a difference in their engagement and their excitement about something. Um, so thank you all for indulging that, indulging us in that um, 
that little look that little bit of fun before we start talking about the more serious stuff. Yeah, so we're <laughs> gonna leave the magic behind just for a moment, but uh, just I, I promise. Um, I did just want to to really reflect on where we are. I uh, decided not to show data on the impact of lost instruction because you all have been experiencing it um, for for many months. But I did want to kind of resurface some data that we've been grappling with for the past 20 years. And that's the nation's report card scores that we get year over year. Uh, this one is looking at fourth grade reading level proficiency. And it's showing that about two thirds of our fourth graders are not reading proficiently by the end of the school year. And that, that trend line is pretty consistently flat. So even when we have all of our instruction and we're in the classroom, um, we still haven't quite figured something out. And so, you know, the, the goal of this event is really to reimagine what instruction looks like. I'm sure there are a lot of um, things that you've tried new this year that, that maybe you want to carry over. I've heard a lot of educators thinking about that. Um, and maybe there's some new things that you can learn from this session that will help you get excited about the opportunity um, of going back to the school year now that you've had all of these experiences um, and, and realizing that there's more work to be done. And so when we think about the science of reading and we've heard a lot of districts are um, either for the first time leaning into this idea or maybe digging even deeper because they understand the importance and the nuances of it. Um, we typically think about whole class instruction in our core curriculum, which is great. It gives teachers a lot of new abilities and um, training on the science of reading. But we really wanna emphasize the importance of, of um, all instruction that students receive being based on that science of reading. Um, and so especially when students are working in their own time or they're working independently, we really wanna make sure that, that that instruction is pushing them along um, the same trajectory that you are working to get them towards in your whole class and small group instruction. And Anne is, is queen of anecdotes. And I, I think you have another anecdote about your experiences with a personalized learning program, is that right? <laughs> I do, yes. Um, and I, I wonder if this will resonate with any of you as well. But uh, I, I was a kindergarten teacher uh, prior to joining Amplify. And in my kindergarten classroom, I had students who were on computers for about like 15 to 20 minutes during the day during their, our small reading groups. Um, and I just used the program that was given to me. I had, I, I will be totally honest, I had no idea what was on it. Um, our principal just said, here's the program that you use. And the kids seemed engaged when they were using it. I saw them clicking around. I saw fun stuff on the screen. And then one day, one of my students had an issue with the computer. So I put on the student's headphones trying to figure out what was wrong. And it was the first time that I had listened to the program. I will, I will admit, maybe not a great teaching practice, but hey, we're all busy. Uh, and when I was listening to it, I just, I couldn't believe how awful the program was. And the phonics just did not sound the same as the way I was teaching it. There were all sorts of bells and whistles and fun stuff, but it just wasn't a purposeful game. I don't even, I couldn't even figure out what the student was supposed to be doing. Um, and I just got so frustrated that they were spending, you know, 15 to 20 minutes a day, which amounts to a lot per week and per year. Uh, and they either just weren't getting getting anything out of the program or like you were saying, Laura, it just went directly against what I had been doing in my classroom. So I feel really passionately about, you know, making sure that, that all instruction is aligned. Um, otherwise, it's just confusing for kids and it just it doesn't help them to make the progress that we know they can make. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you for being vulnerable. I, I do, you know, I fully understand. And, and oftentimes when we're thinking about personalized learning, we think about the data it provides us um, because we don't have a lot of time. And like, that's that's what we need from the program. But, but to your point, we sometimes forget to really analyze and scrutinize the, the instruction that students are receiving that gives us that data. Um, so keep that in mind as we move forward. Uh, so we're going to talk about the key features that we identified again as we were going on our own discovery journey at Amplify um, to what what are the key features within personalized learning and then we'll, we'll break down each. So the first one is how does the program um, place students, where do they place them and what is their instructional focus? What is the scope and sequence in terms of content and how students navigate through the program? 
what is their the program's approach to supporting students when they're really, really struggling? And then finally, uh, what is their approach to keeping students motivated along the way? And so, as I as I said, we're going to look at two sides of the approaches here, and um, and you know, ours is really focused on the latest research in the science of reading. Um, and so, hopefully, this will give you some uh, really clear things to look out for as you're looking at programs. So the first one is the approach to placement and instructional focus. We're going to give you some questions to consider for each of these that you might want to ask um, yourself as you're reviewing a program or the person presenting the program to you um, thought this would be would be helpful. So one is, uh, what is the placement and instructional model in the program? What's the theory behind it? What's it based on? You're doing all this work for science of reading. Is it is it matching your approach? And then how does the program determine what skills students should be working on and at what level? So there are two different approaches that we found. Um, the one that we saw out there has a little, a couple flavors, but the general approach is deficit-based. So really focusing students' time and attention on their weakest skill area or bringing all of the skill areas down to that threshold. So for example, what we're looking at here is a sample assessment score. So let's say the student um, scored beginning of year second grade in phonological awareness and phonics, beginning of year first grade in fluency and vocabulary, and end of year kindergarten in comprehension. So clearly that's their weakest area in literacy. One approach that programs will take is to focus that student on comprehension. They're not gonna get anything else because we're, we're focused on the deficit. Um, the other approach is we're going to bring all of these things, these these topics down to end of year kindergarten um, because we need to have some sort of benchmark uh, where students should start. And so we'd love to know um, if you have any gut reactions to this approach. What are some uh, pitfalls that you that you are thinking about as you're looking at this? Um, we can certainly name some, but I'm I'm curious to hear everyone's reaction. I'm assuming parrotfish came in before I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and by program, we're talking about personalized learning programs that are on a device. So as Anne mentioned, she had her students on um, you know, a center of computers, um, and that's where students would be working on their own personalized path. Um, yes, this is awesome. It is, it is so wrong. It dumbs down learning. And, you know, we've been talking today about equity. Um, this approach is holding students back. Um, and that, that's really doing a disservice to these kids who are, are more capable than, than we often, or programs like these give them credit for. So the other approach, and this is the approach that we take, is um, is a whole child approach. So we're like the definition that we opened with, we are focusing on students' strengths, allowing them and pushing them forward alongside scaffolding and supporting them in areas where they are struggling. We know that that, that, that approach is really going to help students um, in their learning and also their confidence. So we also include social and emotional elements in our program, which you can learn more about later on. Um, but because we know that there's a lot that goes into reading, not just learning the skills themselves. So we're looking at an example here. This is the same um, uh, assessment data that we were just looking at, but here's our approach. Um, we place them where they scored. It sounds very simple, but, uh, but it is, that's what we do. Um, and so we make sure that they are getting the content that's right for them every step of the way. And we will explore that a little bit more um, in, in, in another key feature. So I'll pass it back to Anne for feature two. Awesome, thanks, Laura. Uh, so before we talk about key feature two, I want us all to think about a scenario. As Laura said, I'm I'm apparent I'm the queen of anecdotes, so I love I love a little scenario and a little anecdote. Um, and so I wonder if this or something similar is familiar to you. So please feel free to um, you know make a note uh, if it is, and what you would do in this case. You're working one on one with a student on vowel sounds, and the next skill you have to teach is long vowels and the bossy E rule. Uh, this, but your student is still struggling and confusing vowel sounds. What would you do? 
yeah, I see lots of notes here. Like Reagan, I would keep working with the student on the vowels that they're struggling with. Um, yeah, I think we would probably all agree that you would not move on to the next skill until you knew your student has mastered their vowel sounds. Um, and in some cases, you might even go back a little bit and you might review other sounds that the student knows and build up their confidence and reduce their frustration. Um, can be such a challenge for kids when they are, you know, feel like they're not totally getting something and yet we're, you know, pushing them, pushing them in a direction they're not ready for. And so that really leads us to key feature number two. Um, these are the scenarios that you want to keep in mind when you think about the scope and sequence of a personalized learning program. You want to think about what skills are being covered and when, and what's informing that sequencing. What is that sequence based on? Um, you want to think about whether or not students are going through the same content, but just at their own pace. We know that all students are going to learn at different paces. So does the program allow for that to happen? Does it allow that student who's still struggling with vowel sounds to work on something different while another student may be ready to practice the boss CE rule can move on? Um, and I think, think about what does personalized mean in this program? Think of that student in this scenario we just mentioned, um, or another student that you're thinking of who struggles in a different way, and consider how the program, program might be personalized for that student and what it really means for them. Um, and so when you think about what skills are covered and when, I'm, I'm thinking back a lot to what Dr. Murray and Dr. Whedon talked about is, you know, you wanna make sure that it's based on evidence aligned reading and based on the science of reading. It's actually a little bit shocking how many programs are out there that aren't based on that research. Um, so if you think about phonics instruction, for example, you want something that's going to start with phonological awareness first, teaching sounds and phonemes, and then moving on to phonics and the alphabetic principle and the letters that make those sounds, and then moving into phonics with word, re word reading and decoding and blending sounds. It's taught in a sequence that makes sense and that's backed by research. Um, and you know, then you can also see if it's using other techniques and activities that are research backed, like just keeping on the phonics example, you know, does it use pictorial mnemonics to help kids remember the letter sound correspondence? You know, or if you have the letter um, and, and a picture that goes along with it that starts with that same letter so they can help to make that association. Does it provide supports like visuals of, of lip position, teeth position, and tongue position to help students make the right sounds? All of that is going to be really crucial and is research backed um, strategies and techniques to help students learn. Um, and it's similar with comprehension. You want to make sure does the program focus on both the products and the processes of comprehension? Does it have explicit practice with skills that are known to improve comprehension, such as gap filling inferences um, or syntactic awareness? So I think a lot of that is just a really key part of, of a scope and sequence that's based on the science of reading. And so there are two models that can, you know, that, that are common and that you'll see. I think the first is a linear model, which is similar to what Laura was describing in terms of placement. There's a set series of skills that students are going to go through either within or across different skill domains. Many scopes and sequences are set up in a linear model. You can think about it as there's one straight path through which students need to move through the material. Um, and, and, and that, that's the path, right? So it's, it's like that's the only route that kids can get through. And even if you just think about the scenario that I mentioned in the beginning, we know that this doesn't work for every kid. Um, very few kids learn in a straight line. Um, and so that's why there's another type of model, which is an adaptive model. Um, where there is a set map instead of just one path, um, it's a map, not a line. And so there's several different pathways that you can take. And students experience these personalized paths through it based on their performance so far. Um, and that way every student gets the right level of attention and practice in the right areas. Um, you want to look for something that has full adaptivity where students progress along a pathway that adapts on multiple dimensions, not just that one linear path. Um, an example to kind of illustrate that is that a student can work on early first grade decoding um, while also building on more advanced vocabulary knowledge. Maybe they have really strong vocabulary skills. Um, there's no sense in keeping that 
at that linear first grade level when they're ready to move on in another skill domain. So we wanna make sure that, that we're being adaptive. And this, this is how Amplify Reading approaches this as well. Um, that they're moving through their own learning pathway and encountering personalized content. And I think what all of this really leads to, again, it was, it, this was really resonating with me when I was listening to Dr. Murray and Dr. Whedon is that it all leads to equity over equality. Um, a scope and sequence that's gonna be based on the science of reading ensures equity for all students. Um, many of you have probably seen images like this uh, in a variety of different contexts, but I think relating it to reading is really powerful that, you know, giving all students a linear model is essentially giving all students the same instruction in that same path. And that might not be the right path for all students. Um, so instead, this personalized path and sequence, if you think about that map and that web instead of just that one straight line, ensures that all students are getting the right skills at the right time that's going to help them progress at the same level as their peers. Um, another way of thinking about it is just like meeting students where they're at um, and, and going from there to help them move forward. Um, so with that, I think uh, I will stick to my, I think we've gone a little bit over the 10 minute attention span here, but we will give you all a quick three minute break. Feel free to stand up, stretch, grab water, um, check your email, check your phone, whatever you need to do, or you can just watch this cute video of puppies and we'll be back in three minutes. which puppy you felt like, I feel like we need another quiz of like which of the three minute break puppies most most <laughs> embodies who you are. There was one that looked like it was about to get into trouble at the end, that would be mine. But um, <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we have 15 minutes left. So hopefully that was a helpful brain break. You guys have been really um, 
great in the in the chat and and listening so we want to keep keep this moving and move on to our third key feature um the approach to the program's approach to supporting students when they're really really struggling in the program and, and bringing back what Anna was saying about equality versus equity um, we want to make sure that students are in everything that they're doing getting the best possible instruction and scaffolding um, you know in the same uh, doing what you would do with those students so some things to think about when you're looking at these programs what does it do when a student is, is really struggling with a specific skill? And what is expected of you, the teacher, versus the program itself? So there are two models here that we see. Um, one is a teacher-dependent model in which when a student really struggles with a certain skill, um, the, the student is kind of slowed down or, or, or asked to stop and the teacher um, is asked to intervene. We know that there are a lot of challenges with this. You, maybe you face some of them when if you don't see the notification um, because you're doing other things that are really important, that student's gonna be stuck there for a long time um, or, or um, you know, you, you just may have missed it. And, and you know, what is the program supposed to do at this point? So the other option, and this is what we, what we do, is uh, teacher time saver. So a program that, that actually provides the scaffolding that students need along those pathways when they struggle. So not just um, saying, well, you gotta wait for the next unit, but okay, what else can we give you? Do you give you practice that will support you in really mastering that challenging content? And so we have that, that um, adaptivity really baked into the program. Another way to look at this is, um, so here's an example of those, that sequential lessons, one, two, three. Um, you'll see the student is, is being asked to decode BC, CBC words. But let's say they get it wrong. There goes, um, there goes their instructional time. Now they have to rely on the teacher to notice and do the hard work of intervening, and they are not able to move forward. So I, you know, I've heard horror stories of, of um, students who have just been stuck on content for months because teachers you know, didn't have time to notice and, um, and do something about it. I also hear sometimes teachers will just unlock the next level, uh, but maybe the student wasn't ready for it. So again, what are you really looking for in a personalized learning program if, if the teacher has to intervene when the teacher has much more important work to do with small group and, um, and whole group? The other model is, um, more robust and more complicated, but we have attempted to break it down here. So uh, what we're looking at here is a is a uh, the first lesson. This the lessons are going to be individualized to students in terms of what content is within them. So in this one, the student is decoding BC, CBC words and words with a blend with the letters you see below. They are also isolating the initial sounds of words, and then here they're doing some vocabulary word uh, work. This is a kindergarten example. Um, and so let's see what happens. Here the student struggled with that, with that content. So the program is going to first um, give them some precursor skills. So we think that the words with blends were maybe a little bit too much. Let's take those away. Let's go into a different activity and practice the same letters, um, but without the blends. However, the student was successful in isolating the initial sounds of words. So now we're going to have them focus on the final sounds of words and they were successful with vocabulary. So let's have them go into an e-reader and apply some of the skills they've been working on in isolation to actual texts. So you can see we are, are making, student, making sure that students are advancing alongside getting the support they need to master challenging content. So here, because of that adaptivity, the student is going to try this content again. And we do find that most students are able to master it the second time around. Because not only have they just had this precursor activity, but maybe they're also experiencing these letters and their sounds in the other activities that they're doing in the text or the skill games themselves. Similarly, they were successful in isolating the final sounds of words. Now they're going to segment phonemes. They were great in the e-reader. Now they're going to work on some comprehension processes. So a, a number of things to, to note here is one, you can see that students are working on multiple skill areas at the same time, which Anne um, perfectly explained how important that is in the science of reading program. They're moving forward at the same time they're getting the supports they need. And um, the program is doing exactly what you would do in terms of scaffolding. And you don't have to spend extra time um, intervening because that's really what the program is intended to do. 
So we'll switch gears for a moment and now think a little bit about motivation. Um, and would love to hear from all of you in the chat. Uh, what kinds of strategies do you use in the classroom to motivate your students? Um, or you can think about it a different way. What do you find personally motivating and rewarding in your own life? Switching gears from reading to motivation. Feel free to leave some thoughts in the chat. I know probably some people are feeling motivation for lunch because it's getting really <laughs> close to be lunchtime. But <laughs> um, all right, I'm seeing oh, love for learning something new, choice. That's definitely a good motivation. Leveraging interests and assets, peer shares, seeing results. Yeah, this is this is really awesome. Feedback. Yes, getting really good feedback can be so motivating. I love that one. Um, this is great. Yeah, there are so many different types of motivations. And as all of you as educators know, different kids need different types of motivation. And that's incredibly important when it comes to personalized learning. Um, you want to think about a few different aspects of it. You want to think about what are the aspects of a personalized learning program and and how are they designed to motivate students and how have those motivations changed you want to think about the motivational theory that the program employs and most importantly you want to think about what do your students say about the program do they actually find it motivating what do they like about it i think going to that point about activities of choice and really leveraging interests for kids is so important do they feel engaged by it are they excited about it um, that's going to make them want to be part of it more. And I think many programs will often try to do this by leveraging extrinsic motivation. Um, so, you know, an example of like, giving a student a, a physical reward, like in this picture, you see a piece of candy uh, for doing something. And, and while there's definitely a time and a place for extrinsic motivation, um, there can also be some pitfalls of this. Um, what, what are some of the pitfalls that you all have had in your own classrooms with just using extrinsic motivation? If any. Yeah, I see some things coming in, like there's no ownership. Yes, D, they get bored, right? Um, oh, they just start to not care. They get reliant on needing that reward, exactly. Or negative behaviors start to be displayed. What's in it for me? They start to always want something or they only want it. Um, oh, I love that. No carrot, no effort. Oh my goodness, 100%. Um, so I think, you know, there's there's always a time and a place, but you, you know, you can't always use that carrot, can't always dangle it. Um, especially you know, when you're there's remote. Definitely, especially when you're remote. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it, the, the thing that I always think about with extrinsic motivation is it separates the learning from the fun. Um, you know, you, you want the learning to be the fun thing. You want to give them that ownership. Um, and, and I think that's what's really important in a personalized program is focusing on that intrinsic motivation, leveraging that growth mindset um, where you want the students to keep playing because they feel ownership of it. They feel excitement about it. Um, they truly feel proud because they're growing and getting better at something. Um, I know reading is really fun after all, um, but so often kids don't think that because they don't see it as something they're good at or they see it as something they're bad at. Um, and I think continuously using extrinsic rewards in a personalized program kind of reinforces like you need to have this physical reward in order to want to keep doing this um, when that's not necessarily true. You know, I think the uh, again, I just keep thinking back to the keynote because it was so wonderful this morning of like 
all children can be taught to read um, and, and that and they can be taught how fun that is and that the power of reading and what the power of reading gets you. Um, you know, and I think you're all probably thinking of students who could really benefit from some additional intrinsic motivation. So celebrating and encouraging that growth is, is what will build that intrinsic motivation. Um, and, and then it won't go away. It's not about dangling a carrot. It's about building that, uh, that, that belief in themselves and, and sort of understanding that it's fun to learn and it's fun to set a goal. All of the things that you, you mentioned, um, it's fun to set a goal and fun to get better at something. And I think the phrase we often say at Amplify Reading that I find myself probably saying way too often in life is, you know, keep going, you're growing. And, and that's, that's really what you want kids to take away and what a really high quality personalized learning program will provide. And Anne, can I, can I, maybe it's not an anecdote, but can I jump in for a second? Are you trying, trying to take over my title as queen of anecdotes? No, never, I wouldn't do that. But I just yes, wanted to please. call out, so someone, someone mentioned at the onset with the Shakespearean like ruffles, um, you know, it was, it was a literary customization. Um, the, what we're looking at here in this GIF is a power that curiosos can, um, can learn as you grow, and it's called book magic. And it allows you to pull items and ideas out of books to help you solve problems in town. And so this is just an example of, of really embedding the magic of learning into exactly, um, into, into learning how to read. And I, I just love that example so much because it is, it is what we do in, in real life, um, you know, metaphorically. Thanks, Casey. Yeah. Thank you so much, Laura, for flagging that. I think that's a great, that's a such a good example. Um, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. So um, we, oh. oh, sorry. No. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I'm cognizant of the time. We have um, three minutes. So if you have any questions, please throw them into the chat and we will do our best to answer them. We just had a couple um, close out slides that I will talk through and then we will we will address any questions. Uh, the last consideration, especially during during this upcoming school year and years that we know are going to be really challenging and important that we are being really thoughtful and um, and careful with what we're doing is to consider the the, um, the folks that you're working with, um, the publishers of the programs you're using, are they really going to be partners with you throughout the, um, the changing needs that you're going to face over the coming years? This is just an example of how our reporting has, um, has grown up over the past three years because we, we really appreciate the feedback we get from teachers and we, um, we adapt just like our program does. So, um, uh, so as a reminder, you know, we're, we're looking for programs that are focusing on both strengths and needs, motivation and agency, like we just looked at, supporting all students to, to become the readers that we know that they can be. And again, Amplify Reading has um, the science of reading-based approaches to all of these key features. We think about the whole child in terms of instruction and social emotional learning. We are adapting to their placement and their needs as they grow and change. And as a company, we are adaptive. We save teachers time. You have so much work to do. We're gonna give you the data you need to help inform all the work you're doing outside of the program, but we have you covered. And as we just saw, we are, are focusing on a growth mindset and showing students, having them experience how fun and exciting and transformative reading can be. So we have a website here at the bottom, readingsuccess.amplify.com. If you wanna look more into Amplify Reading, um, we also have a Facebook group if you would like to join and hear more from other educators or um, if you are an Amplify Reading educator, share your thoughts. And then finally, and I think most importantly here is that we, um, we didn't wanna dive into the program too much today because we really wanted to focus on the, the takeaways and how you can use them to evaluate programs. But we do have a webinar coming up on May 26th that will go deeper into the program if you are interested in learning more. Um, we will add that link to the chat and we really hope to see you there. Um, well, we're out of time, so so please do do um, join Facebook, and we can answer your questions there. But we really are appreciative of the work that you do and the time that you have spent with us today. And any last final final farewells? 
No, this was wonderful. Thank you all. Uh, really appreciate you taking time out of your days uh, to spend with Laura and I and with the rest of the Amplify team. Thank you. Yes, Laura, you can see that in the daily attendance calendar starting July 1st, and it's, it, it's a toggle on, your, um, on some other views of the data. We listened. 